The more words we use, the less those words matter. When I'm teaching, I really think about how much am I saying to these athletes? Am I creating more dependence on me? Because ultimately I want them to be able to go to any team, any situation, any court, any game, right? And believe in themselves. That's what I want to instill. Hey guys, so before we get started with this week's podcast, I want to remind you that we have our retreats for sale this year. So we do have one of our retreats sold out, but we still have spots for two of our retreats. And if you love the content that we've been putting out with the Evolve Move Play podcast, and you want to really understand in your body what it's like to put together deep movement practice with mindfulness, with nature connection, and with community, you owe it to yourself to jump on a call and see if these events are right for you. So you can jump on the link in my bio, and I look forward to seeing you on the call. Bobby. It's good to see you, man. Welcome on the Evolve and Play podcast. Appreciate you having me here. Uh, looking forward to this. Uh, first came across a couple of years ago and I heard you on uh, Joel's and I was instantly intrigued by what you had to say. And, you know, I know I'm in a different space with basketball players, but seeing what you do with your parkour, running through the woods, all of that. I mean, I love it. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I love uh, I love seeing the, the same kind of language, same kind of stuff being done within the basketball world so i love seeing what you're doing and basketball was a was like one of my first athletic passions so in my my uh high school years i was homeschooled but i was just playing pickup basketball all the time i used to play like six hours a day sometimes i was terrible at it i had like zero understanding of the game uh, it's just purely writing off athleticism but uh, i've retained an interest in the game so it's cool to see what you're doing so I hate getting this question myself, which is like, oh, so tell me how you became you in the world. But uh, I think you know, your story is so unique that we kind of got to go back and start at the background. I'm sure you've told it like a million times on podcasts now, but um, you had a pretty intense transition moment that kind of led you onto the path of where you are now. So I'd love to share that because I'm sure my audience isn't necessarily familiar with you. So you're, you're a basketball skills coach and strength and conditioning coach. You've got a big social media following, kind of bringing constraints-led approaches into, into that world, bringing some interesting biomechanical thinking. How'd you end up there? How did I end up there? Right. Yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. Where, where do you want me to start child? Like, <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, I get asked this question all the time and I really need to come up, you know, and refine how I tell it, but I sometimes, I almost like to let my mind go and like, yeah. you know, how, how am I at where I am today? And I'm just going to let my mind go. I was, I was always immature. I, I, I was big. I'm six foot seven. Now I was always the biggest kid, but it, it, I was never comfortable with, with, my bigness. I was that inside. I was a baby inside. I was a teddy bear inside. I was emotional, right? From my early age, from going from kindergarten to first grade, I, that, that, that jump was so hard for me. And I was let, you know, it was like the orientation to first grade and I'm not letting go of my dad's leg. I won't let him go. And I'm the biggest kid there. They're like, you got to go to first grade. You're bigger than everybody. Right. And it's kind of that same thing has stayed with me for a long time where I just, I loved outdoors. I loved nature. I loved being with my dad. I loved sports. I loved everything about all this movement and play and all of this, but like the, the social aspect of team sport, the social aspect of, of school, all these things I never fit in. If I was sitting at one table, I was you know wondering what it was like to sit at another table. And I, I was always so concerned with what, how others viewed me and what they thought about me. And, you know, it was, I just never felt part of. So my bond with sports and movement and all this was probably built, you know, with, it, it was a way in. And I, I knew if I put work in at a young age, if I went and got the shots up with my dad or he was throwing me batting practice with baseball or he was our soccer coach and all this, it was one, I had my dad there. Right. And two, it was a way to have some interaction where I, if I could excel at a sport, I might get validation for being good at a sport. And I was never a superstar early on. Uh, in sports, but I, I, I did, I did karate. I did, I was on the swim team. I did tennis, baseball, basketball, football. I did, um, I, I could go on and on with it. I did everything. So I wasn't a superstar at any of it, but I, I had this dose of so many different things. And, uh, by the time I got to high school, I was, I matured late. I was, you know, a little pudgy. I, I still socially awkward, still quiet. I couldn't put a sentence together in public, but I uh, started to narrow it down to basketball and baseball. And then my freshman year, 
my sophomore year of high school, my baseball coach said, you're too tall to play third base. And I, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to go play basketball. And now, now I'm playing basketball and I hit a five inch growth spurt and I go from, you know, six, one, six, two to six, seven, I lose all the baby fat. Now I'm dunking, shooting. I get picked up by an AAU team and I'm traveling all over the country, getting recruited. And then I get in a fight and I put my arm through a glass door and, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, uh, get over 300 stitches in my arm and, uh, around this time, uh, partying and drinking play into my life. And I, I still worked hard. I still had the work ethic and I was still that teddy bear on the inside, but I wanted to destroy that, that, that emotional, you know, that, that, that teddy bear, because I didn't think people, you know, if you're a nice kid in high school in uh, North Jersey, you know, you tend to get uh, taken advantage of. And it, it's, it's scary to be a nice kid that holds the door open for people that's polite. So I wanted to kill that guy. Right. And, um, I started to develop this edge, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to have this edge. And rather than playing the game of basketball beautifully, I knew if I, if I lifted weights, I knew if I worked harder than everyone, if I knew if I took this kind of term, like Terminator mentality, I could go out there and make people like punish people on the court. And I became a bruiser and all my effort went into like, cause I could, I was strong. I could jump, I could do these things, but I, I lost that. I lost, you know, you watch greats play and anything they're effortless. And I lost all of that. And in conjunction with losing that, I started to party because now when I drank and went out, I, I didn't care as much what people thought about me. And I was at the parties I wanted to be to. And by the time I got to college after this arm thing, it ended up being a division three school instead of division one. And I was an experienced partier. And I never, I always worked hard though. Like I'm the guy that would party all night till six in the morning and be in the weight, you know, in the sauna at seven 30, trying to sweat it out and then getting a workout. And, and uh, to progress that story forward um, at this time in college, I'm a junior and uh, I herniated a disc in my back falling. And the only thing keeping me above water was, uh, was basketball. And I lost that. And now it was all into the, the partying and the medication for my back. And that progressed the next couple of years in college. And then I get out and the painkillers progress to heroin. And I'm stealing from all my closest uh, family members and loved ones and businesses and anybody I could to, uh, to support that. Cause I had a physical addiction to heroin. And I, I, I know there the stigma isn't as much as it used to be, but I, my mom is like 30 years sober. I have six sisters. The one's a PhD in audiology. The other one's an anesthesiologist. The other one is a, uh, is an attorney. They're all, the other one's a nurse practitioner and, and, and I'm the bouncing you know, boy with six sisters that are all highly successful. I always knew what they wanted to do. And here I am getting high by myself, every white notching, watching Netflix, um, you know, a failed basketball player with no hope. And then on November 18th, 2012, the best thing ever that could have happened to me, my mom caught me stealing checks from her and kicked me out of the house. And, uh, I had no place to go. And, uh, Went through that whole process and uh, it, it wasn't at that. It came to a decision of, you know, am I going to die or am I going to live? And luckily I chose the latter. And in order to do that, I had to completely change everything about myself. And I had to start trusting people and I had to listen to people and I had to not just listen to them, but follow them. And I, I met people that had similar pasts like I did. And I got surrounded with people of, you know, smeared of addiction and alcoholism and all these different types of things. I met guys with like 20, 30 years in recovery and all this. And they just took me in and loved me. I couldn't put a word together. I couldn't put a sentence together. And these guys took me in and they said, you never have to feel this way again. And for whatever reason, that hit me so hard. I'm there broken, you know, a couple of days off of detox and on a couch. And this guy tells me, you never have to feel this way again. And in that moment, I believed him. And I said, what do I have to do to get on your side of the conversation? And he says, you're going to follow us and do what we do day at a time, right? 10 years later, I, uh, I've been all over the world doing what I love because I, I, I didn't know anything. I'm so blessed to be broken because I had zero responsibility and I had this, this, you know, it was die or grow. And I chose grow and I went all into growth to listening, to learning, and I had no responsibility. So I could really find who I was as a person. And then that started, I wanted to play professional basketball. So I started like, it was like, you know, don't drink, don't do drugs, eat, sleep and train. And that was my mantra. That was all I did for the first couple of years, you know, get through the day without getting high, get through the day without drinking, train. And I got really good at basketball. And because I was working on myself with these people, my confidence started to come back. And then I'm in the Dominican Republic playing professional basketball. And I can, you know, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what else to do other than play basketball and work out. So I reached out to my trainers who trained me in high school and they happened to be very successful trainers and they both gave me jobs. And 
my idea was that I, I really enjoyed the, the strength aspect, the performance aspect, and I really enjoyed the skill aspect. And I didn't think anybody had a place where basketball players could come in and, and work on both. And they told me not to do this because you want to be an expert in one thing, right? Pick, pick skill, pick strength. And I said, I'm going to be an expert in training basketball players. And uh, because I stuck to my guns, because I had zero responsibility 10 years later, I think you're starting to see uh, what I do. What I'm doing is starting to be done by others. And it, it's becoming a thing, but you know, it took 10 years of sticking to my guns and not chasing money, not chasing bigger facilities, keeping my stuff low and, and being able to do it my way. And uh, it's incredible. So I, I let my mind go there. As I said, I was I'm not yeah. sure if I did a great job answering it. And I'm sure there's a lot to fill in between, you know, uh, I think that's what being you broken. And yeah. you have to tell the story again, as you got to just find, find it and let it come out the way that, that it, it needs to come out. Um, I, I want to get into the strength and, and, um, the integration of strength and skill. I think that's such a, a compelling thing. And so it's also interesting, just how like skills training has evolved in basketball. I'm curious about that, but, um, before we go there, I'm curious how that, that perspective were you, did you go into AA? Is that kind of the support that you got? I'm not allowed to say that okay. I, I work, I work, I work in uh the program yes okay. <laughs> okay there's a program um so you so you got that support and i'm curious how that kind of having to address those deep emotional issues early on in your journey how that has impacted the way that you approach working with the kids who come to you yeah like i i think there's a lot of in our industry of, of training and coaching athletes, everything is like coming from like the, the coach or the trainer is coming from a position of power where I will, I admittedly come from a, a position of, of weakness and brokenness and vulnerability. And I lead with that because I, I think it's the greatest asset I have with connecting with young athletes because the majority don't have elite mindsets. The majority aren't confident. The majority of humans, the majority of athletes, right. Are struggling with, with self-image are struggling with, fitting in the, the driving force for most high schoolers, boys or girls is fitting in. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's why they all have the same haircut. It's why they all have the same clothes. Right. And, and I'll point this out and it could be a black kid, white kid, Indian fat right next to each other. And they all have the same type, you know, different genetics and, and what happens, but they all have the same haircut. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they want to fit in. And it's like, I, I see that. And I recognize that because I, I remember, where living like that brought me. So the fact that I've been through this, this pain and suffering, right. Allows me to relate to athletes and basketball players on a, on a deeper human level. And what I find is by opening up and, and not being, not trying to, I know everything, not I'm great. I, I have so much knowledge. It's, you know, I, I'm a sick and suffering human. Like I believe everybody else out there is too. And when, when you admit that, that, that lets people in, it lets I don't know everything that, that allowed just saying that I need help. Like today, 10 years removed from this. I just celebrated 10 years, November 18th, you know, was 10 years. And it's like, I, I still don't know a lot. I'm still broken. And, and, you know, and just that, that admittance saying that opens up the ability for things to come in and, and learn and grow. Yeah. You have a different foundation to rapport with the, the students who are coming in. Yeah. Your population that you work with is mostly high schoolers. You work with college athletes as well. Yeah, um, I, it, it's in my gym is mostly high schoolers, but now I'm fortunate where I get to watch a lot of my high schoolers compete on TV every night because they the Division One players and you know some getting into the pros overseas, a couple guys in the NBA and stuff like that. So it, it's really cool to see that. Um, but in my gym, you know, once they get out to college and stuff, they're kind of going off to the races all over the, you know, I get to see them when they come home for Christmas and, and stuff like that. But the majority of the population I have is basketball players. And I cater to the people that, you know, really want to do something with the sport and it, it basketball is just my, you know, I, what I, what I'm, I like basketball. I like working out. What I love is, is teaching. What I love is learning. And I love teaching people to be great at something. My thing happens to be basketball, but my focus is really on teaching people how to be great at a thing and what it takes to be great at a thing. And because I've come from brokenness to wherever I'm at now, not putting myself on a pedestal, but I, I do have something to offer in that realm. And I'm so blessed because I get to use basketball to teach that, right? I'm, I'm teaching them how to learn. Right. I'd rather teach people how to learn how to move than move. Right. Yeah. And and that's the focus. Yeah. Well, there's a, 
uh, parkour uh, generations, big parkour um, teaching organization. They they had a phrase that I really liked, which was like, "Teach the human first. It's like, you know, a substantial number of the kids who come into you, they're not going to be Division One players right, or mm-hmm. NBA players. And so, if you're if your only focus is can you deliver them there, then you're missing the opportunity to deliver the lessons that are contained within uh, within that quest. It's funny you say it because. And it's not like they, if, if a kid gets cut from his eighth grade team and makes his freshman team, that's just as important to me as if a kid goes from D3 to D1 or D1 to the NBA. And my process for teaching an NBA player, my process for teaching uh, an eighth grader who got cut from his team is the exact same thing. And it's all about bringing them to the edge of their ability, right? That's, that, that's where progress happens is the, the edge of their ability. So there, there's not much difference in the, in, the, in the principles of how I teach an eighth grader or how I teach a professional. Right. It's the same thing. So I, I can keep the same, the same thought process and the same intensity and the same. It's just me. It some, we have a fourth, we have a beginner group of fourth and fifth graders, and we had them running around the court, the other, you know, run, run to half court as a gorilla, run it, you know, and it, it's like understanding where they're at and how to get them, you know, just comfortable being kids. And it's like, it's the same though. It, it's not, you know, what it ends up looking like to them or how they're perceiving it might look completely different on a social media post, but my thought process remains the same. And it's meeting that human where they're at. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the, yeah, the, 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 that ability to scale and find what takes an athlete to their personal edge, right? How can you mm-hmm. deliver that 2% change and like the Miha Chicks and Holly type of uh, kind of conversation, but do it for someone who is fourth grade, uh, fourth grade. You know, the ball's huge, the rim's far away, six foot seven, NBA prospect, you know, uh, it takes a, a creative mind to see how you're going to take that, both those people to their limit and, and work with the mentality they come in with, right? Like, yeah. uh, the kids are going to have fun with with the the being a gorilla maybe a little bit more than, uh, <laughs> than the adults might. Maybe not. Maybe you'll find some adults who love that too. Depends on the kid. Yeah. Yeah. So... I'm curious about the world of skills training in general, right? So you're, you're kind of one of your distinctions in the industry is that you're doing your in-house strength and skill and you're supervising both of those, but just the idea of like widespread skill specific training outside of a, a program or coach seems like it's a relatively recent thing within basketball. I mean, maybe I I misunderstand that, but I feel like when I was coming up in the nineties, you know, there wasn't this sense that like you could go work with a coach to improve all of your of your skills in basketball. So it seems like that's been a kind of a growth of 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 coaching itself is something that has coaching to build the athlete rather than to build the team for a for a high school or an AAU team. Seems like it's something that's relatively recent. How have you seen that develop over the years? Yeah, I, I think it's you know, there, there's a lot of positives and negatives to it. And it's like, I'm trying to almost bring back some of what you experienced in the nineties, yeah. right. While also understanding that the game has evolved since you've played it in the nineties yeah. and players get away with a lot more today. You know, you see, everybody, you see the stuff, how it's displayed in the movement and the creativity and all this kind of stuff and how far these elite players have brought in the game or changed the game. Steph Curry, the, these yeah. guys, and it'd be, a lot of the trainers, it, 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 it's like this whole new world, right? Of, of focusing on it. And I think we, as coaches and trainers, we want to like make everything a blueprint. Like I'm going to teach this person a crossover. I'm going to teach form the exact way. And, and we're going to become so focused on what the body is doing. And we completely lose touch with the environment and how that molds the player. So I think like, I, I'm a trainer, right? I'm a basketball trainer and I believe there's way too many basketball trainers and I believe there's way too much dependence on basketball trainers. And that's tough to say for a lot of people. It's not tough for me. I don't want my players dependent on me, but I think anytime we add more coaches, trainers, teachers, I don't ultimately, I think we need to remember, we don't want our players to rely on us. And that's hard to say if we're trying to scale a business, right? 
where I, I can have a kid in and I can correct every single detail and think that he thinks he's getting world-class service because I'm focused on how square his feet are. I'm focused on his mechanics and I'm critiquing everything. I'm giving him a good job. But I like to say like the, the loudest one in the room is the weakest one in the room. What does that mean? The more words we use, the less those words matter, right? So when, I, when I'm teaching, I really think about how much am I saying to these athletes? Am I creating more dependence on me? Because ultimately I want them to be able to go to any team, any situation, any court, any game, right. And believe in themselves. That's what I want to instill. And it's that like, every, like, I don't, I'm not just saying I, I, I want the players to come first and not my, not my beliefs, not my, you know, system. I want them to come first. And if I'm continually reminding myself of that, it really changes how I go about teaching. Yeah. How, how do you experience that change? Like, the i i know ex i feel like i know exactly what you're saying because i feel like i've gone through the same evolution of like oh i'm i'm a genius it's all in my brain they just need to absorb it too versus recognizing mm -hmm. i'm actually just sort of facilitating an ongoing process that's unfolding within them that i can get in the way of just as easily as i can actually help with yeah when you start to really watch the the humans you're training right like when I, when i'm delivering something when i am speaking and you can begin to see how they're processing information I, it becomes apparent that people process things differently people learn differently so i need to remember that who i'm teaching doesn't process the way i do and they're not motivated by the same things that i'm motivated by yeah. we're not all after the same thing and we don't all get to whatever we're after the same way Right. So as a coach, as a practitioner, it's not about my biases. It's not about what I believe. It's about what's going to get them from wherever they're at to wherever they want to go. And, and, and how do I create that practice? How do I influence that practice? And everything that I'm doing, most of them that my demographic wants to play college basketball or wants to make their team. So there is a team aspect where they're going to have to go play for a coach in a team setting in this, you know, there's fans there, other people and influences other than it's not a training environment. Like they're not, they're not training to get good at training with me. Yeah. Right. They're not with me to get good at being with me. They're with me to get good at being in their environment, the competitive environment. So when I look at so much of what is done from a skill training standpoint, it's getting them good in a training environment. I need to prepare them for competition. So how come most of the training I see is below the level of the competition? It doesn't make sense. I, I, I'm an avid uh, bird hunter with my dog and bird dog training. And, and I run her through different trials and tests and things. And there's a common thing in the bird dog training world. You train above the level for the test. If I'm training for a 200 yard blind retrieve, right? If the, the test is a 200 yard blind retrieve out wherever, yeah. I train on a 300 yard retreat, mm -hmm. right? Well, like, why, why don't we take that approach with teaching skills? And why do we think we need to tell everybody that there's a certain way and it just slows down the whole process. The most difficult part about playing a game is the rate at which we perceive and act. That's the challenging thing to maintain emotional balance, to not get all out, to not be scared of it. Like if you talk to anybody and what they really struggle with, it, it's carrying over whatever they're doing in training to the game. It's common. So what, what are we doing to address that common issue? And not much. Oh, shoot like this. Oh, crossover like this. Okay. Do it this way. Here's three steps to jump higher. I can go on and on with what is, what is being said and done in gyms and nothing is preparing them for the competition. Yeah. Not nothing. So there's actually great people out there. So I don't want to like, just say bash the entire industry. I'm not trying to do that. It's just, I'm, I'm speaking in what I see. Yeah. And I want, yeah. You see people take a very mechanical approach. It's kind of like if you were trying to win the you know, the Indy 500 and you spent all of your time building the car and you never trained the driver. Yeah. Um, or did it in a simulator. Yeah. Right. Or Right. It's the same thing. So it's interesting though. I, I want to make a distinction here because she said train past the test. And I think Above there's the a, level a mistake the that people can make there. Um, and I think there's an interesting distinction because a lot of times that comes out as just do more intensity and more mm -hmm. volume. I was listening to Tony Haller uh, on Joel Smith's podcast, right? Feed the Cats. Yeah. He was talking about how, like, he thinks that track coaches are making a big mistake by overloading their 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 athletes with volume of training in order to do that. So it's like, okay, well, if you're going to run, if you're going to run 100 yards, and we're going to do a bunch of 400 yards, and you just make the athletes slower. 
So what I've seen with you is like you often kind of talk about this idea that the, the, the you get funky with your athletes. You get very complex with your athletes in the demands that you put on them. And the critique that I guess you get back is, oh, that'll never happen in the game. Yeah. So I think what you're talking about is really scaling up the complexity of the demands so that instead of just giving them a super simplified environment and then trying to get them to do a rote repetition that looks the way you want it to look, you're trying to increase their capacity to adapt to complex situations. Right. I'm, I'm driving efficiency by dosing complexity. Yeah. Right. And I, I like to talk about it in terms of a jump shot because everybody can picture a jump shot. Mm -hmm. Now, a successful jump shot is one that works in competition, right? Yeah. <laughs> it can handle duress, right? It can handle speed. It can handle chaos. So rather than me worrying about where the athlete's elbow is or the sequence or where their feet are, I tell them to shoot as fast as you can. Now try to shoot as fast as you can with something wonky in your form, with a hitch, with a, with a loose follow through, with uh, whatever the, 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 the optical flaw is, try to do that fast. And it becomes very apparent. It's, you can't be successful. Now I'll do a, a 180 shot where your back is to the rim and they're at the three point line. You have to jump in the air and rotate in the air, locate the rim quickly and go. Try to do that with a nice, without a follow through. You can't, right? So I'm adding complexity there with one with speed and one with rotation and a jump and a quick focus that is going to drive the behavior that I want without telling them anything about their behavior. Mm -hmm. I just modify the environment. Yeah. So that's, or I add a close out. Yeah. Question. Somebody is closing out of them fast. So you have a split second. You have to dribble through your legs three times. The second you start dribbling, the guy in the baseline is going to start closing out with you. So you want to do that. He's closing out. Boom. Watch the form. It's pure. It's perfect. Yeah. I love it. Watching some of the drills you set up where you you basically create a constraint for the two athletes. And so you have one playing defense, one playing offense. And then you're, you know, when I say go, I was just watching a drill that you did. You had one of the athletes backing up, doing a, a you know, what do they call it, the term anymore, step back. He's doing a step back mm -hmm. three-pointer. So you had a starting point and three-point line. And then you had another athlete at a starting point and had a ball and was trying to block the three-point shot with the ball. Mm -hmm. So by manipulating this, you're going to get way more reps of experiencing the type of stressors that are experienced in the game than if they just play the game. And mm -hmm. unlike just having them do a standing shot or a shot independent of any other athlete interaction, it's going to be far higher in specificity to the game. Correct. It's not about when I'm saying train above the level of the competition. It's not about more volume, more stress. It's understanding the right stress, right? The stress that is actually similar to what the competitive environment is. And, and can you get there hundred percent? No, because there's no coach. There's no refs. There's, they will at some point begin to get comfortable with me. And then they still may struggle to not be comfortable with their coach or they don't have a good relationship with their coach like they do with me. But that's, that's things we talk about. Yeah. Or that's maybe sometimes I'll blow up and I'll yell at them. Mm -hmm. just to just to give them that right and then I, it, I i do this like by design i will blow up and yell at people and and single them out in front of the group of eight kids to somebody that i know isn't good at handling that because yeah. i'm preparing them so the being an individual player and at that level it's going to happen to them and then i bring it in at the end of the practice session i talk to them and i explain to them why i did that mm -hmm. it's not because i'm mean right it's because I'm, you, you told me you want to be a division one player you gave me that ammo right yeah it's a bit of a, what we call coyote mentoring, right? Yeah. Um, where you, you intentionally push someone's edges also emotionally. Um, but it's something you gotta be careful of. Have great rapport with your athletes to start with. Yes. Oh, they love me and we hug and you know, it's not, this is, yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about specificity within the sport context. Um, one of the interesting things about you, obviously, is that you're you're integrating the strength and this uh, skill together. So tell me a little bit about why what you think the advantage of having that in kind of one house is and how you look at the type of strength, the type of kind of mm, sports performance work that you want to do in addition to this very constraints led. Sounds like you're also leveraging like differential learning principles. Um, Correct. So 
so you're approaching it that way in the in the in the skill room and now you're going over to the strength room kind of what's your your philosophy on the integration of those two it's always evolving and changing and i'm reworking it but it seems to get better the longer i continue to do that and again back to your you know it's not about about the volume stuff and that if if everything is in house i'm aware yeah of what's going on i'm aware of how much stress they're going right so i can't take into account I can take into account, but I can't change the fact that they're going to play seven games in a, in a weekend on an AAU tournament, or I can't change the fact that their coach is still trying to, you know, run countless suicides and 17s and things like that. And get, I, I, right. But I, so I know that's happening. And now when they're coming in, it's one less conversation I need to have with them. It's one more, it's one less thing, right. That I need to account for because I'm completely aware of the amount of volume and stress that's being put on them in the weight room. Right. So it, 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 it makes it the process more efficient right? Having everything in house. I know what's happening. It's one less variable to account for. And then understanding how I train them on the court. We do the most of our jumping on the court right now. People will say in the actual sport of basketball in a game, you're not getting very max effort jumps. Well, when they train with me, I make sure they do, right? That's why we have the backboard touches. That's why I'm, you know, getting them up to dunk and do all this stuff. We do it both with a ball and not. So I don't need to dose them with much jumping and stuff in the weight room. I don't need to do it because I'm hitting that in my skills training. So I can make it very general, Mm -hmm. right? I can, we, we, we have various assessments we do and we don't need to get into all that. And I can find out more about how my athlete moves as an athlete and what they're, where they're at in terms of strength and power and jumping and all this kind of stuff, which may dictate the program I give them, but simply we, we keep it, we can, we can raise the strength bucket. Right. And I'm looking at everything as a, you know, from from an affordance standpoint, from an opportunity for for action standpoint, where not just the skill training, but the strength training. Fundamentally, what is strength training doing? I get somebody stronger, bigger, faster. Right. It's giving them more opportunities for action in their sport. Right. A 50 50 ball is no longer me and you are six foot seven, weigh the same thing, but I'm faster than you. It's no longer a 50 50 ball. Mm -hmm. But unless I calibrate the ability to move on the court. Right. It, it doesn't matter if I'm faster than you. If you're smarter than me, you move yeah. a more efficient way than me. You have a stronger, right? There's so many variables, right? So it still has to be calibrated on the court, but I'm still looking at strength training as, you know, creating more opportunities for action. If I get this guy from a, a 25 inch vert to a 30 inch vert, right? Yeah. More rebounds, more, I can, whatever, score more, get over people. And I, I'm looking at everything through that lens where I don't care about how much somebody squats. Am I giving them? more capabilities? Am I expanding their capacity for more specific work even, right? Stronger tissue, more resilient tissue, tendon health through all the that we don't need to get into training, but that's what strength training is. And that allows them to do the specific more. Mm-hmm. I think about this trade-off between uh, I call it specificity, right? So, um, you know, the more time that we spend in the sport, the better we're going to get at the specific aspect of the sport. And you're going to get, you know, you can improve your vertical leap by dunking, right? In fact, maybe that's the best way to improve your vertical leap in a lot of ways. That's actually, I don't, I don't play basketball, but I practice dunks because, because it's way more motivating than jumping at a target when you're, when you don't have that variability, that fun aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have that, but then at the same time, there's this, this problem of, how do you dose the chaotic right precisely enough so think about strength training as a um as a tool for de- or not just strength training but any sort of conditioning as a tool for delivering a physio- uh, physiological overhead on that athlete's skill level you don't want the athletes this is an idea i got from christopher sommer the this uh the gymnastics coach you don't really want an athlete to be hitting their physiological limits at the edge of their skill. You always want a little bit of a buffer, right? Um, and so that's that's what you're always trying to uh, – like that's how I think about it. You're always trying to sort of like say, I want to be – I want to spend as much time in the specific as I can without – reaching these edges where I'm not able to dose it specifically enough because you're going to end up getting injured more frequently. And then I go over to the the ancillary training to just bump the level up so that the skill training isn't going to, isn't going to exhaust my capacity for strength. Isn't going to exhaust my capacity for speed. 
Um, but I've seen what you're, you're talking about, about like I had an athlete who I worked with who he started training with me when he's 11 years old. Uh, he's a football player. Um, but, uh, he did parkour, football, martial arts. He got a concussion in his uh, sophomore season. He was out of football. He's a very talented athlete. So I thought maybe we can get him a scholarship if we send him over to track. So I sent him to work with an elite track coach. Um, so he just did track for three months. He comes back to parkour and he can't calibrate his jumps anymore because he's so much powerful. Every time more powerful, every time his foot hits the ground, it moves him farther than he's used to. Mm -hmm. And so all of his precisions, he's bouncing forward and looks erratic and out of control. It's like, this is awesome. Like you have this opportunity for action now that you didn't, but it's just terribly calibrated for right. actual sport. Um, so I, I think that that how we play with that is is very interesting. And, and, and then you see like friends Bosch and folks like that, like really working on like how do we make the the exercises themselves as much as comparable in demand to the sport as possible. Whereas what I see in your stuff is the, the strength training is relatively, I mean, a lot of your strength training looks like it's kind of the same, st the simple stuff, right? Like, let's do some trap bar deadlifts. Let's do some standing on one leg. It's not necessarily um, single leg cleans or something like this, where you're looking really, really tightly at that relationship. Is that how you think about it? It was like, you're, you're, you're building that overload. And then how do you, how do you kind of try to play with that line between specificity versus overload? It's to speak in like, broad like that is so hard because yeah. there are athletes I have that we do modified Olympic lifting with. Yeah. Right. I have an eighth grader that is strong beyond his years. He, he's stronger than most. And he's one of the top, they rank eighth graders now, but he, he's top 25 in the country ranked as an eighth grader. And a kid can, he, he weighs 113 pounds and can do a push up with 90 pounds on his back. Yeah. Like what, do we need to get him any stronger? So maybe just dosing him with some skill work, differential learning, however you want to paint the picture. Right. And teaching him, uh, you know, uh, hang clean to a single leg, like ju just some stuff just to challenge him still. I'm still trying to create a challenge, but for the most part, these kids that are coming in, they, they, they can't do a push up. Yeah. They can't do a pull up. They can't goblet squat, you know, 25 pounds without falling over. They can't do a single leg pistol squat. They can't, like, there's so many things that they can't do that. I know if they can do, they'll be stronger. So it's really simple. Right. But it, you have outliers and you have different things where, you know, is there, are there symptoms? Is there, you know, some pain, a low knee pain, right? A lot of kids come in with knee pain. So we have to handle that first. That's the first, before we get into any of this, we need to figure out what's causing that knee pain. If I have to ship them out to a PT or if I, you know, has it been diagnosed as jumper's knee and we have a protocol for that and what we do with them and we tend to get people out of jumper's knee relatively quickly, two, three weeks, and then they're back into strength training. And it's, we're constantly measuring and re-measuring too. So it's like, I have these phases now where it's like, I have these kind of templates, you know, phase one, phase two, and they're all, you know, whatever, four to six weeks, two to three weeks. And I have it out and we can kind of auto regulate on the fly. Right. And make changes when need be. But I, but I have certain things that I know work. Mm -hmm. So we do them unless we need to change them. And if we measure somebody, if they're not getting better, if they're not progressing, if they're not getting stronger, if they're not jumping higher, if their 10 yard, 10 meter sprint, isn't getting faster. Right. We need to change something. It's not working. There's no adaptation happening. We're stressing them the wrong way. And the best way I know how to do that is by continually measuring, remeasuring. And I don't post a lot of that stuff. Our lifts, our kids probably lift for 20, 30 minutes. So they're there for an hour. The first 10, 15 minutes is spike ball, pickleball, some game we invented, right? Walking on a rope, barefoot, stuff like you do, jumping over things, having fun, playing tag, throwing a Frisbee, kicking a soccer ball. We come up with stuff on the fly. They get their general strength work in in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then we end with what breathing, would, you know, we end with something to get them ready for their skill session. Yeah. I, uh, I, I did my, my strength training yesterday. It was, you know, 60 minutes of, of, you know, a diverse jumpy, basically jumps. Cause I'm trying to be a better jumper. Right. And the last 20 minutes is, is the strength training. Right. Just, just, Front squats. That's all I was doing. Front squats and front squat. Yeah. I like front squats. I do. That's what I do. I haven't lifted weights in six months. I probably lifted weights six times in the last six months. I'm jumping as well as I was six months ago because I've, I've stayed, I've kept jumping. Yeah. And some days I'm like, I feel weak. Like I need to get back into, you know, smashing some weights. And then my, my trainer was like, he had 500 some pounds on the trap bar. 
I'm like, you know, knock two plates out. Let's see. And it was like four something. I went over there and stood up and I'm like, weakness is not my problem. Like, yeah, it's not what I'm lacking right now. Mm-hmm. I'm still pretty strong. Like I have a good base of strength because I've strength trained for years. Yeah. I've, I've experienced that. I, I've lost some strength recently, but, um, you know, I had a period where like I, I was really into deadlifting and got my deadlift up to like 440. And then I had a, uh, I went to a sport, uh, sport of performance science and they were like, you should never deadlift again because your strength profile is very good for deadlifting and not good for other things that are more important for you sport wise. So like you should split squat. That's, that's your main, your main strength thing. Yeah. And I did. And then all of a sudden I trained less volume and felt better and jumped farther. And it was awesome. So two years later, I was like, you know, let me just, let me just try a deadlift. Just yeah. see how I retain it. It's like pull 365. Real yeah. easy. Could have pulled more. I was just like, that's probably enough. I know I'm strong. Yeah. It's interesting how you can sustain those strength gains. I um I think that's a really interesting thing that I think there's a variability about that that has to do with where you are in your life, what's going on. But I think people underestimate how persistent some of these adaptations can be. And then, you know, they overdose them because because they're not realizing it's like, oh, you just need enough of that, and then you just need to see it often enough. I, I I was listening to someone talk about a Olympic an Olympic high jumper, and he discovered that he only had to strength train once a month. Mm-hmm. Right? He he needed to be able to like I don't remember what it was, but maybe he needed to be able to squat like one and a half times body weight, and that was like squatting any more than that did not deliver him better high jump gains, right? But if he couldn't squat that much, then he wasn't going to jump as high as he could. So he'd get himself to that during the off season, and during the on season. He had to squat once a month in order to keep his legs strong enough. And that was all. So, yeah. So I think that's a, it's a just an interesting thing for people to think about. So one of the things that I like about the basketball world is the, the jump training, right? And the way that they jump and the mechanical understanding of jumping that you see in basketball. Because the, the two-foot uh, approach in basketball, so the two-foot takeoff in basketball, is very similar to the two foot takeoff we use to flip or to do diving vaults in parkour that split you know the like a darian bar would talk about you make a a triangle with your legs you're gonna make a triangle yeah. and that and that sagittal plane instead of in the front off plane um if you're getting lateral so you make that triangle and you create power out of it and you, you bam you you explode and what i see is that like really good basketball players do that incredibly well. You watch John Morant, um, you know, and the way that he can get his hips down and create that, that collision with the floor that rebounds him like crazy into the air. That's something that I want, right? I want to be able to do that. To dunk would be great, but I want to do that to do a side flip or a front flip. So Over a I, tree. Yeah, exactly. I want to do that too. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's super fun. Um, yeah. And like... Like in my own, it's interesting. So uh, my son is eight years old and he's he's a really, you know, pretty gifted athlete and very kind of just has that mindset to just want to want to work on things. And so he's he's eight. So he's, you know, mostly we're just, I've just been like, let's take you somewhere cool and let you play and leave you alone because I don't want to put too much structure on him. But he's reached the age where he starts to ask me like, dad, I want to learn to do a backflip. Can you come over and help me learn? to do a backflip. So now it's kind of turning into this coaching relationship. Um, so I'm watching him, I'm watching the way he moves. And he, I, I think I'm kind of like a strength elasticity hybrid. Like, you know, I was hanging out with Joel Smith and he was like, you have a narrow ISA. You probably shouldn't spend too much time in the weight room, but I'm, I'm pretty heavily built. I'm six, one and two twenty. you know, at a healthy weight. Um, so I'm kind of in between and I, I, you know, I used to squat 355, deadlift 440. So I, I can, I can kind of do the strength thing. My son right now is incredibly elastic. Like he, he, his body does not like getting into low positions when he jumps, he'll jump. He can jump higher proportionally to his height over something than I can. He, he can do a, he has a 14 inch standing vertical and a 19 inch approach vertical off one leg he does a one leg approach he doesn't do a two leg approach vertical and he can hit 19 inches um but if you watch him his hip like barely moves up and down at all when he jumps like he's just straight elasticity so we've been working on his uh his kong vaults double kong vaults so he can he now can do a double kong vault which is awesome um 
but when I was watching him, I noticed he does the same thing with me, which is that he skips, he goes up a lot into uh, that penultimate step rather than getting mm-hmm. that low hip position. And and I've struggled with that um, myself. So it's like, I know that I need to, that I, or it seems like technically I should be keeping my, my hip lower as I come into that last step. So I'm curious about kind of like, just if you're going to take your expertise and say, hey, I'm going to work with some parkour athletes. I'm going to help them build up that specific ability that, that that basketball players have to utilize that really well. How could basketball help us in the parkour community do that better? Off one or off two? Off, I'm talking about off two. Off uh, two. Yeah, but then we got back to your son talking about off one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's – I have – I love this because it's like I have kids that come, I'm a one foot jumper. I'm a two yeah. foot jumper. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Like, it doesn't mean like, are you one foot jumper because that's all you've ever practiced? Or are you like, is it because you're narrow? I say, is it because you're more lat? Right. And that's things I have to see in front of me. But I, I think taking it like, what's the part that we need to improve there? Mm-hmm. Like, what, what are you trying to improve? Like, exactly. Like, For me? spell it out. Oh yeah. yeah. For me, I want to improve the height of my side flips and front flips so that I can more easily go off objects. And where are you seeing the problem? You're you're coming in too high. Yeah, I'm coming in too high to the penultimate step. It's very hard for me to get my. So I would reduce it to that step. So rather than rather than coming in right and taking you know a build up into it, right where you're going to be higher and you're going to have to move lower longer, let's say, or you're going to have to move high and get low. I start my athletes in a squatted stance. Uh, So your, your squatted stance is going to be different than mine based on anthropometrics and Mm -hmm. whatnot. But I I want you to stand there, feet square, bend your knees, keeping your chest up right until your heels start to lift, Mm -hmm. right? That's your squatted posture. That's your athletic posture. That's where you can get to before you start, you know, heels elevating and and, and coming out of it. So you're going to start there just square. Then you're going to move your left foot back and you're, you're going to be able to sit down a little bit more. And I want you to feel comfortable in that position. Right. And now we're working. Let's say my left foot is back. I'm in a now like a split stance, squatted posture. Now I'm working down. I want my front shin to drop to the floor. So what you're talking about is maintaining that squatted posture so you can jump higher. So you have more room to unfold. Right. So we're kind of starting in this folded position. Now my shin is dropping to the ground. I'm leading with that shin. I am now falling into that jump. And then it's a left, right and get up. And you're using less energy because you're not doing the run up anymore. So you'll get more reps, get tired less, and you're still getting that horizontal to vertical transfer. Mm -hmm. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me because I, I just watched a bunch of your clips this morning and I think I know exactly the drill that you're talking about. I'm like, Oh, I post it every day because I think I don't, nobody does it. And I think it's the the easiest thing ever to teach jumping off starting your, your athletic base stance. Uh, and then uh, you, I think you were showing it like a, uh, like a uh, false step variation into it. And then basically right. and why I'm not queuing push, we don't need to get into the whole yeah. push fall thing, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. But now when I do, if I do run into this, what's going to happen on that last step is I'm going to roll over that penultimate and not push through it. So this is teaching by the focus being on knee or shin over that big toe, mm-hmm. right into the step, right? That's in my mind going to transfer to now when I'm running up right? To jump over something. We're working that roll over rather than the giant push. And that's why I do it that way. Interesting. Okay. So do you, so on the step preceding the penultimate uh, step, do you want to see a long push into that step or you want them to roll over into that step? I I teach roll over. And then if there's a a certain, this is where it's different from what I'm doing to what you're doing. Uh, What's going to work best for you may work different in the team sports setting because there's so many things going on. Now, if I split a double team and I can get a big, you know, into it and I really want to freaking go up and tear the rim off. Right. That may again, but a lot of times it's in transition and that doesn't happen. There isn't a long step or I don't have an opportunity for a long step. So I need to use the loading strategy that is, right for that moment yeah right so there isn't just one way to do it if you watch jaw right like go up for a dunk when he's just practicing dunks right there's no game situation if if i'm remember correctly you're going to see a long very long step before his his penultimate step comes down um i think you can find both 
I, I think if, if I sent you videos on his, I think it would depend on the dunk that he's trying to do and what he's trying to accomplish. And I think he, he transfers energy so efficiently, whether he pushes or not, he is in that low, low squad position now that we're talking about. Um, we were talking about Jaws' approach strategy. And you're saying you, he's just really good at it, I guess. Go ahead. <laughs> Maybe you can recap. I, I think it's hard without it in front of me. I think to do this in this form without the video of it in front of me, right, to see what I'm seeing, I think you could be looking at one image of this or you have one video going in your head and I have another. And I think, again, it, it's dependent on the situation and that moment. Yeah. When I was doing kind of last season of podcasts before we had to put it on hiatus, I was like, we gotta, I gotta start doing podcasts. We just like do some video analysis with the guests. I just sit down and like, like have a plan for the video analysis. Um, I love that because it's like you hear so many things in the S and C world or this and how and mechanics yeah. and this and that. And it's like, what do we actually see here? If two guys that yeah. you know we're just on this thing and and we're you know just looking at this, what do you see and what do yeah. I see? And it doesn't have to be a better than or whatever. Just like, what do you see here? Maybe yeah. we see things differently, and that's all it is. Maybe we're yeah. we believe the same thing. We just explain it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that'd be, uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to it just reminded me. That's a good idea. I was thinking about, Joel, that. Yeah. Thinking about with Nick, uh, Nick Winkleman, how would we cue this? Um, and then, uh, yeah, that'd be fun to do it with you as well. So I think if we get athletes doing this young enough, we don't have to cue it. Yeah. Yeah. That's you have your eight year old in the, what'd you say? I'm bringing him to cool spots and letting him go. Yeah. Like that's, that's what I want. That's what I want. I, I want my gym. Yeah, full of basketball players to be that cool spot where they come up and it's a playground. I want I want my place to know we don't have monkey bars and slides and this and that, but I want the athletes that come here to have that same feeling that an eight year old gets at a cool spot or on a playground. Yeah. I want it to be full of information and and this and that, and where it's like they get a, to move and explore and, and try things. Yeah, and I think that's being taken out of it with all the coaches and trainers. Absolutely. Do you find that um, the kids you work with now get less pickup basketball time and are doing more and more just structured time? Uh, it depends at the level. Okay. Um, the, they're, the AAU has been so watered down to, you know, give everybody a jersey and go out and play that like you just. It, it's become more AAU focused and travel team focused than go to the park and get some pickup in. But like that stuff, like that level of AU that I'm describing, it's not very competitive, mm -hmm. right? And so it kind of is that pickup type feel. So it might be a good entry point for a kid that's like trying to develop confidence and play. Yeah, and I think like pickup can be different in the suburbs than it is in inner city, right? Yeah. There, there's, you know, it can be completely different. So I think there's definitely less, but you know, I, I drive by the parks every once in a while in, in the inner cities, it's thriving. Yeah, You know, the, the outdoor kind of and one stuff like the New York City summer basketball with, you know, there's Rucker Park, Dykeman, West mm -hmm. Forestry. I mean, that is a lot. It, it's bigger than it ever has been with social media because like it, it's yeah. captivating. I've played in it and it's it's so much fun and it's insane at the same time. But like it's yeah, there's less. And then in some areas, it's probably just the same or more because now people can promote it and show it. So like there's still a big culture that are playing in the streets. OK. It's interesting. I was just, you know, generally we're losing play as a culture and it's really impacting how adaptable kids are and how, you know, how, how resilient their systems are. So I was just curious about that within the basketball context. I want to go back a hundred percent where I grew up. Yes. Yeah. Where I grew up, where I live, where my gym is in the suburbs, these mm -hmm. kids don't do anything. Yeah. They're, they're on their screens. A hundred percent. They're not in the woods. Screens. Yeah. Or they're doing their structured sport activity. And their parents are dropping them off at their team practice or whatever it is, or their AAU. And, you know, it's a big, it's a big thing. It's a bunch of mediocre, mediocre stuff going on and being celebrated. Yeah. That's just not me. And that's okay. Like, and that's good. Like that's not everybody has to be as passionate as I am. Not everybody wants to like be great at basketball and that's okay. So they, that does serve a community and it's better than nothing. Right. It is. And it's not that it's not even bad. I don't even want to put it in a context that that's bad or wrong. That does serve a community. It's just not me. Like, again, in the beginning of this, I talked about I want to teach people to be great at something. Yeah. I have basketball as a medium to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the pursuit of greatness is 
it's weird. We were over professionalizing kids sports in a lot of ways. And yet also at the same time, we've become a culture that is very uh, ambivalent about the idea that greatness is something you should pursue at all. Right. <laughs> Meritocracy <laughs> is, is dying. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to go back to what you said earlier about jumpers knee. That's something we in the parkour community experience a lot. Right. So I'm, I'm just curious for your insights on that. Like I, I've, I love all the single leg work that you do uh, and the isometric work that you do. That's stuff that I found really uh, effective. I've also found the backwards sled dragging that Ben Patrick made popular to be really, really good for knees. Is there anything else that you're finding really helps uh, athletes overcome knee pain or prevent them from getting into knee pain? Uh, talking to them. Talking to them. <laughs> you know, what, what bothers your knees? Oh, when I, when I play seven games, you know, all right. So for now we need to limit that. Right. And it's literally like, what bothers your knees? Yeah. What, what do you notice that you do that really bothers your knees? We're going to try to tone that down a little bit. Okay. Let's stop doing so much of what really bothers your knees. And let's do more of the stuff as you just mentioned, strength training, isometrics, at things that we know what tendons respond well to, right? So different loading, right? Something that's going to strengthen it. Ice, Advil, this is not going to, it's not going to do anything. And like kids still don't know that. Kids still think ice or heat is going to solve a problem that has to do with stress, right? And it's not, we need to create stronger, more adaptive, you know, resilient tissue, mm -hmm. right? If we want to withstand the load that your sport demands, the jumping, the running this, right? So we need to, for the time be, and it like this can happen, you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, if they listen, but if they're continually putting in the same thing that's pissing their knee off every day, mm -hmm. it, there's not much I can do. So yeah. it's really talking to them, like what about, you know? And once they start mm -hmm. to understand that, it's not overly complex as we want to make it. Pain is a request for. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to that idea of like you know, uh, physiological overlay, uh, overhead, right? Building that in the right way that's not causing the same the same type of stress in the knee. Um, and I think, yeah, a lot of times, like uh, my friend Todd Hargrove uses the statement, uh, "Pain is a request for change." Right. So if your if your knees hurt when you're when you're playing six hours of basketball every day, like diversify your training, back off the basketball for a little bit. If you're doing parkour, and you're taking a bunch so of drops. Important. Drops are fine, that, you know, but the dose makes the poison. Yeah, and the language of this is so important because I I, I don't want to to. I don't want to bring fear to this. I don't want my athletes to believe they're broken because they have knee pain. And I don't want them to start thinking they have to, they're, they're like something's wrong with them or broke. I don't want to give pain that much power. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't talk about it much on social media. I've spent years going down mobility rabbit holes, the FRCs and the three, you know, all this different type of stuff. And I could put content out there regard, but I like, where's it going? Hey, what am I ultimately trying to do? And even with the kids in my gym, it's such a case by case way of how I communicate this stuff with him and like, and develop again, he, he he's going to take this information different than the person next to him. Right. So what am I going to say to this athlete in front of me that is going to make them feel like they're okay. We're going to handle this. And we're, yeah, we'll, we'll get this settled in two, three weeks. If you listen to me, yeah. not a big deal. I don't need you, you know, formaling for nine hours before every practice. I had knee pain. Um, for about 18 months, like a year into my parkour training, right? You know, just not eating well, not sleeping well, not not dosing my training appropriately. Went to doctors from my local family doctor was like, oh, squatting's bad for your knee. Just like your knee should never mm -hmm. go below 90. Stop doing everything that involves that. I've looked at the knee anatomically. It's not designed to go below 90 degrees. This fat fuck like no yeah. <laughs> not listen to this guy so then i like went through all of his rigmarole finally got to go see the, the surgeon who worked with the seattle seahawks at the time you know this should be top of the field uh yeah you've got chondromalacia right you've got deformation of the, the cartilage on the back of your patella um your your femur just moves in a bad way. It's genetic. You're never going to be able to get over it. You'll have surgery by the time you're 35. You should stop doing parkour. Um, and I, I remember I was like, just please prescribe me a visit to a PT. It's like, am I going to be able to do anything? I was like, just, just do it. Six weeks later, knee pain's gone. And I used the things that I, I learned from that PT to help 
dozens of parkour athletes get out of knee pain. It's just like, yeah, learn to control yourself on one leg. That was the basic thing was like control your knee on one leg. That was really yeah. most of what we did. Yeah, um, your your experience there for learning. I mean, that's how I, I've I've broken ankles, rolled ankles, you know, herniated disc, knees, back. Like I've I've done it all, and I was always interested as to how I was going to fix that. And like you just said, I'm able to replicate that with my athletes because I've done the thing. Like you're teaching parkour athletes, you do parkour, right? You're in the I see it. You're doing the stuff that you're teaching, and it it creates again that you know th- does a trainer need to be good at what he's teaching? He doesn't need to be, but I think it's cooler if you are. <laughs> so we have. So chronic knee pain is a big problem in parkour. It's a big problem in basketball. The other injury that is really a big problem is the ankle sprain, the acute ankle sprain. So that's not to the same degree something you're just like, okay, well, we'll back off your loading in your sport, increase your tenant specific strength training. This is has to do with the chaos of the game. I was actually I'm gonna go on a little bit of tangent and connect these two ideas, but I've been talking about what are the fundamental athletic things that everybody should do as a base, right? It's like parkour, exploratory locomotor play, every species engages in it. Humans everywhere do it. It's foundational. Parkour is the best expression of it. Everyone needs to manipulate objects, move things around, right? We're humans, we're tool using animals. Everyone needs to be able to move well with another person, both combatively and, uh, and, and, and cooperatively. So, you know, martial arts, dance. And then team sport is interesting because you kind of get all those things, right? There's a lot of parkour in basketball, even though there's, it's a different, the obstacles are other people and the spaces that you have to move around with them. Yeah. But it's there, right? It's locomotor demand. And then obviously you've got the, the implement, you got the ball, you got to be able to throw it, catch it, move it around, manipulate it, um, dribble it. And you're always, and you have to coordinate with your teammates and you have to, get past the guy in front of you or prevent the guy uh, with the ball to get from getting past you, et cetera. So it has all these elements. And I've been thinking about which sport actually contains all the most fundamental athletic elements, the best of all the team sports. So like football, like American football is problematic because most of the players on the team don't actually handle the ball. So they don't get the throwing and catching particularly well. It's too specialized. Um, Soccer, you don't use your hands. It's like we're hand, we're, we throw on catching animals much better than we are kicking ball animals, right? Um, I like rugby a lot, but you don't overhand throw the ball. So I was thinking about it, I was like, basketball is kind of the only sport that I can think of where the natural action of throwing is fully there and catching and all the, all the actions. And there is contact. It's not, it's not full, full contact like wrestling or, or rugby or sorry, rugby or football, but but there's a lot of contact in basketball. Um, so it's like, it's a very powerful education system. The problems I have with basketball are the, the, the geometry of the game is so selective for height and length as determinants of, of ability, right? It's a game that's really, really rewarding to just be bigger than other people. Um, and because the, the hoop is up there and you have to go up and you have to look at the ball, people sprain their ankles all the time coming down on people. And for me, as someone who's like sprained my ankle repeatedly, I can't really go to basketball as a, as a, as like my main tool anymore, because I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to have an ankle sprain and not be able to do parkour and not be able to do other things. Um, so I'm curious about, like, yeah, just that, that, that idea of like, how does basketball fit as this like general athletic development tool? And then we have the specific risk factor. It's really dangerous to ankles in my experience. How do you ameliorate that with your athletes? Um, with regards to the ankles or the, ankles. the complexity of the sport, the no, no, no. It's, it's two connected questions, but I was curious <laughs> okay. what your thought was on like this, this model of like basketball is actually like one of the most complete athletic disciplines from yeah. a sport perspective. I, I think if you took a high level basketball player, he would yeah. translate to most every other sport easier than players of other sports to other sports. Right. If you were good looking at it, like as a donor sport, I think like I've had wide receivers, like division one wide receivers that train with me in basketball and they attribute a lot of how they are in being a wide receiver in football to basketball training, going up, catching things, doing things in the air, being creative, right. Very similar ankles. I, I think it's generally more of a perception, you know, piece to it. What you're talking about and it's still 
you know, training at the level of the test, putting them in those situations so they can begin to pick up more information. So if I am going up with the ball and I am doing these things, I'm going to have to do that in the competition, right? I'm going to have to go up sky for a rebound in a crowded paint. There is going to be a chance I'm going to roll ankles, but the answer is not avoiding those situations in training. It's how can I make it maybe a little more safe, right? How do we still, right? If we, and a lot of the players like that, that, what we're talking about before, like you got really good at sprinting, right? And then you're going and you're, you're running past everything, right? Those scenarios happen a lot. And I have kids that just have no control. They're just like, like I have this, a couple of kids that come in, they're running over little kids. And, and like, if there's a female in the class running, like they have no control over their bodies, right? Those kids are going to spread ankles or hurt somebody else. So what's the answer? I'm meeting them where they're at, trying to, you know, what's constraints, what can I do in this practice going up? You know, we do we do close out drills and, I, and I'm telling the defense, listen, I want you to be there. I want you to get underneath. It, like I had this one drill, the offensive player is throwing the ball off the, the glass and has to go catch the ball in the air and finish. Right. That was step one. So you get two steps. You're throwing the ball off the backboard, catching the ball in the air and finishing before you land. The progression of that is now there's a defender right somewhere in that drill. Yeah. Right. Maybe has a ball in his hand to make it safe. I just want you to give a little like and this is I have to trust them that they can do this. But, you know, give a little bit of contact, you know, disrupt him a little bit. And now we are feeding that athlete. Right. Similar stressors that they're going to have to navigate in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can look at it from, you know, how can we create? Can you bulletproof an ankle? Um, no. But if we are doing, you know, I don't all the different stuff we can do barefoot or, you know, we can go into the inversion eversion and train those specific areas. We can do that. And, you know, yeah, I mean, we can definitely make the team stronger, but like, I, yes. I think that what you're going at is really important, which is that the perception action coupling and like the, the speed of being able to go yes. from eyes up here to awareness of what's happening with your feet. You know, particularly a lot of times, you know, these tall kids who are gawky and, you know, just don't know where their their legs end when they're 15 years old. Yeah, that seems like a, a huge, huge yeah. hurdle to to like. How do I get those athletes to be resilient to this specific injury? Like, a, you know, I I sprained my ankle uh, in November of last year. It's still limited, right? Like my dorsiflexion is still. I still have an anterior uh, limitation in my dorsiflexion right now where it's just like stuck. And I sprained each of my ankles eight times severely playing basketball between 12 and 18 years of my age. So I think that's been one of the bigger like limiting factors in my athletic development ever since where I'm always trying to like basically get past my – I did it five years. Do you remember my old gym that I had? It was like a little box, like really small, my court. Yeah. I went up for, I was, we were playing three on three in this little place that we shouldn't be playing three on three. Cause there's no sideline. There's no, it's yeah. just a wall. And I went up for a shot and I was drifting and I came down against the wall, you know, grade three sprain r- r- literally ripped apart everything. And my ankle was on a knee scooter for months. It couldn't walk. And it was probably in the past six months that I actually felt comfortable taking off at speed off one. But you know, it's like, how do I adapt? I became way better off two because of that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's like it's always that competitors compete, winners win, right? It's like, yeah. can I instill that in my athletes? I just, I, yeah, it's just a, it's a real curiosity in me since I sprained my ankle. I just sprained the other ankle about <laughs> seven weeks ago, so I, I went like twenty years without ankle sprains, and then I sprained both my ankles in, in two years. That's how it uh, goes. And so I, I've been thinking about it, and I've just been thinking about this, the perception coupling aspect of it. It's like, okay, I, you know, I can stand on the ball. I can I can do all the drills. But, like, ultimately, what I need is that, like, that my brain is better connected to that foot and ankle and is able to pick up what's going to happen and create upstream solutions, right? It's like I'm never going to make those ligaments strong enough to deal with the rest of me being stupid. So it's like, no, you, th- those ligaments are not going to be with hand, be able to withhandle 220 pounds coming down on somebody else's foot from, you know, 36 inches in the air. Yeah. The, nothing can like, that's, you're not gonna be able to do that, but now how can I get three feet up in the air and now manage that fall, right? Manage that situation better where I'm not coming down on somebody. What strategies can I find, you know, inst- instantaneously while all that is going on, not to come down on that guy's foot. And I think you have to be there. I think you have to put the kids in those situations. 
we yeah. get a sprained ankle from time to time in our training. It doesn't happen often because I'm, I'm, I'm as safe as I can be without being safe. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Right? I really think of, I don't want to put these kids in positions to get hurt. And if they're, you know, some of these kids that are going to be scholarship players and stuff like that, I really don't want it to happen in my gym. So I am safer with them, yeah. you know, because they have to go, you know, some of them are playing. Yeah. For sure. In other places. So I, I, I don't do, and they're, they already have that. If they're at that level, they don't really need that from me because they can already do those things that we're trying to get out of these other athletes that are maybe a little less experienced. Yeah, you got to be. I think those those drills that you do or you're doing like limited offense defense where there is another player involved, but it's not five on five. And the scenario that you're, yes. that you're going into is constrained. It's still chaotic, but it's less sources of chaos. That's how we can scale that perception action coupling. Um so that the athlete is more resistant to those injuries. Yeah, I'm creating situations, right? So in if we're if we're continually doing just three on three or five on five, think about how much of that time is just like running up and down. Yep. Or, you know, like how much if, if it's five on five, how many of those players are actually getting better in that five on five setting mm -hmm. and are being exposed to the things that they need to be exposed to to get better. Right. You're gonna have one guy to shoot most of the time. Then you have a second guy that kind of plays with him. Then the other three are kind of just sitting there complaining that that guy's shooting all the time. That's generally what happens, yeah. right? So it's like, I like these one-on-one -on -one drills, two-on-two -two drills, one-on-two. Like I do one-on-three. The kid, the kid gets the ball at half court and he has to shoot a three-point shot and there's three people guarding him, mm -hmm. right? If you can yeah. get that shot off, right, with three people guarding you, knowing that you can't drive by them, <laughs> right? I started playing. You're going to be a pretty good shooter. Oh, uh, I convinced some of my parkour buddies to do a little bit of pickup as a warm up after I was listening to Joel Smith. Um, but we only we only had three of us, right? So we were playing one on two um, every time that we got yeah. the ball. Uh, you know, playing twenty one. And this was before a parkour session, and it was, it was so tiring, right? <laughs> it was so tiring to have to try and get through two guys every time we get to the hoop, and we can't shoot very well because we haven't played basketball in ages. So like getting yeah. to that's my go-to. I just shoot. <laughs> right, we we're like, we're not going to make it to twenty-one. We're going to make this eleven. Like, we got to get, we got to get out of here so we can get to the parkour. Um, yeah, go jump over a tree. Yeah. So, okay. Um, I feel like I had one last question for you, but I think I think that it's escaped my my brain. So I think I'm going to let you go for today. This is the time we had. Um, if anyone wants to find you, just Bobby White on Instagram. You have a new, you have a podcast yourself. I noticed effortless athlete. Um, anything else? Uh, that has been discontinued. We have, I don't think I put anything on there in years. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, no more. My that. my producer my producer stopped producing and okay. uh, I wasn't able to figure it out. So don't worry about that. Okay. Um. So and then uh, good drill is that your website? Someone. Uh, don't that? worry about any of that. They can find me on Instagram. Is good. Okay. Just Instagram is good enough. Yeah. They'll find you from there. Yeah. Uh, anything yep. any last words you want to share with folks? No, this is great. I love what you're doing and I appreciate you having me. Uh, you always get my mind going, which uh, is fun. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It was great to have you and uh, I look forward to our next chat.